In the book of the Revelation is a, a vision that the Apostle John saw, but the way it's been written, we actually see these things with him. We're reading what John saw, but we're also seeing it. <clears throat> so in this, these final two chapters, this is the final part of John's vision. <clears throat> and we've seen a new heaven and a new earth for the former heavens and for the first heaven and first earth were passed away. <clears throat> and we have seen in this chapter, verse 2, the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband, and now we take somewhat of a pause here. It's as if heaven is going to ask us now, do you know what you have just seen? Do you know what you have just witnessed? Now what, the Lord's not going to leave this up to someone's guess or man's interpretation. He's, he's provided for a great voice out of heaven to tell us what you've just seen. So that's our text today here. <clears throat> This is too great to be left to the opinions of men. <clears throat> and this is the manner of the Lord. You know, He provided angels to Ezekiel <clears throat> and to Daniel and to Zechariah and other prophets who had visions to explain to them what they were seeing. God, God doesn't just give a vision and then, then leave you to think about it. And this is the case here. He's going to tell us <clears throat> about this because this is a very great thing. <clears throat> When the holy city, New Jerusalem, is seen coming down from God out of heaven, it's of such significance that God has chosen to have a great voice out of heaven announce what it is that we've seen. <clears throat> so, what hath God wrought? Now this is not, the, the announcement here is with a great voice. This isn't just as, as a one man would speak to another man. This isn't just so that John can hear. This is a great voice and it comes out of heaven. So, so this is an announcement to all who have ears to hear this. Amen. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will, shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. <clears throat> Behold, the voice says, let's look here, set your attention on this vision and give consideration to this. When you see this holy city, the new Jerusalem, this is what God wants you to see. The tabernacle of God is with men. That is the holy city. This, the city that you've just seen coming down, this has received the approval of God. This is his dwelling place. And in John's vision today, today is the divine moving day. The appearance of the holy city means that God's dwelling place is with men. And if you're familiar with scripture, you know that God promised that this is what he would do. There are uh, at least three places here. One in Exodus chapter 29, verses 45 and 46. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God that brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. And Leviticus 26, verses 11 and 12, I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you, and I will walk among you, and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. And long after the tabernacle had already become obsolete, after Solomon's temple was built, and even after that temple was destroyed, God continued speaking about a tabernacle among his people by the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 26 and 27. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God and they shall be my people. So the, this great voice out of heaven is announcing that God has done what he said he would do. And in the most ultimate way, you are witnessing the tabernacle of God with men. <clears throat> the great voice from heaven speaks precisely about this. God's tabernacle is not in the holy city, but God's tabernacle is the holy city. The saints of God are not living in the holy city. We are the holy city. 
the tabernacle of God is with men. These redeemed men who have been built up together are his dwelling place. And in this vision, we see we have seen God's dwelling place come down out of heaven to the new earth. Now it's interesting here that the Holy Spirit chose to use the word tabernacle. You might think that, that he would say the temple of God is with men. But he says tabernacle. So I wanted to look into that and see why. So I gave consideration to that. <clears throat> the primary definition of tabernacle is that it's a habitation. Although it, it can mean tent. Usually when we think of tabernacle, we actually think of kind of a flimsy structure, something that's like a tent, it's portable, it's meant to be temporary, it's not meant to remain in one place permanently. So you have to wonder, why, why did God say the tabernacle of God is with men? <clears throat> David said here in Psalm, uh, chapter, Psalm number 27, David uses four different words in reference to the habitation of God. <clears throat> One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. Now it doesn't sound like David speaking of a temporary place here. He's talking about being hidden, being secure and safe. He's talking about being set up upon a rock. So I'm, I'm going to look at several scriptures here. This is the first one to show you that tabernacle does not necessarily mean temporary. Not necessarily. <clears throat> As we can see in this text. <clears throat> David also refers to his own house as a tabernacle in Psalm 132. Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go up into my bed. I will not give sleep to mine eyes or slumber to mine eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord and habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. You know, this is when David dwelled in his house made of cedar, and he looked out and saw the ark of God dwelling within curtains. But here in the 132nd Psalm, he refers to his house of cedar as my tabernacle. You know, David didn't live in a tent, <clears throat> not, at, not at this time. <clears throat> and <clears throat> uh, that's recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 7, <clears throat> when David looked out and saw the tabernacle. And the, uh, tab uh, the word tabernacle is used by the prophet Isaiah in reference to a prophecy of Christ. And in mercy shall the throne be established, and he shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking judgment and hasting righteousness. This is talking about the house of David. <clears throat> you know that Christ sits, is said to sit on David's throne. And again in Isaiah 33, Zion is spoken of as a tabernacle, and even in the sense of being a tent. Isaiah 33:20. Look upon Zion, the city of our solemnities. Thine eyes shall see Jerusalem, a quiet habitation, a tabernacle that shall not be taken down. Not one of the stakes thereof shall ever be removed, neither shall any of the cords thereof be broken. So even if you do want to look at the word tabernacle as a tent, we can still say that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be moved. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's portable, that it's, gonna, that it's going to come down. <clears throat> the, uh, the temple that David desired to build for God is referred to as a tabernacle. And this, Stephen spoke of this in his sermon in Acts chapter 7, talking about David who found favor before God and, to, and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob, but Solomon built him a house. Now David wasn't thinking of building an improved tent for the ark of God to dwell. He, he wanted to build a sturdy, a large, permanent structure for God to dwell in. <clears throat> so this is, I'm showing you how the different ways the word tabernacle is used in scriptures. And you can see where I'm going here that we're not to think that this is something temporary in our text when it says the tabernacle of God is with men. That doesn't mean that it's going to change sometime in the future. <clears throat> In Hebrews, Paul refers to the heavenly place 
where Christ dwells as a tabernacle. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. And a couple of more. Revelation chapter 13, verse 6. This is where the beast opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And one more, chapter 15, verse 5. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. This is speaking of the the very place where God dwells, the very precise place. <clears throat> I give these examples to show that the tabernacle is, is, the word tabernacle does not always mean temporary or movable. So when we begin to think about the tabernacle of God being with men, that is in the holy city, New Jerusalem, we don't want to be left the imp with the impression that this is something that's temporary. <clears throat> so then, the, we ask the question, why does the Holy Spirit use the word tabernacle instead of temple? I confess I just have begun to look into this and I don't see this as clearly as I would like to, but this last text that I read in Revelation 15.5 gives us a clue to this. <clears throat> it says, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony. The testimony being the ark of the testimony. So the temple was like the larger house and the tabernacle of the testimony was like the smaller house within the larger house, the ark of the testimony being in that tabernacle. So the, the idea is that in the, in the Revelation 15 text, he's narrowing down your focus, your attention to the, the very precise place Amen. where God is said to have dwelled. The temple of the tabernacle of the testimony, the very, the very precise place. <clears throat> You know, Solomon built a, a temple that was much, a much larger building than the tabernacle was that Moses built in his time. Solomon's temple had porches and gates and uh, many rooms and great walls. And there was nothing wrong with this nothing, because this is, was uh, designed and David provided the materials and, and God did indeed bless the building of it and after it was finished and Solomon prayed God did come and dwell in it and bless the people with his presence in that temple so there's there's nothing wrong with this temple I don't want to leave the impression that the, the temple was uh, was not necessary there was something wrong with it but by comparison the tabernacle was much smaller and it was more precise because it had to be because it had to be portable it had to be able to be taken down. When, when God began to move, he, he wasn't going to linger and wait for them to dismantle a giant structure and figure out a way to, to carry it. This, this had to be right now. We're moving. The, the pillar is moving. We're going to move with God. So the tabernacle had to be small. It had to contain only the necessary things, just the precise things. <clears throat> Because of the tabernacle's smaller size, it had to be more precise and less complicated. So there was no room for anything in the tabernacle that was not absolutely necessary for the service to God. And the tabernacle, although beautiful and glorious on the inside, was more condensed by necessity. The main thing about the tabernacle was that it was the place that housed the Ark of the Covenant, <clears throat> which is where God dwelt between the cherubim above, above the mercy seat, as it is called the tabernacle of the testimony. <clears throat> Therefore, at least one reason why the great voice from heaven says that the tabernacle of God is with men is because we are speaking about the precise place where God will dwell <clears throat> with men. Not just the general area, not a large area, but the very when we talk about the tabernacle, we're narrowing it down to the very precise location where God is. It's in this city among men. And the, again, the tabernacle is not in the city. The tabernacle is the city. <clears throat> to be precise, the holy city is the same as dwelling between the cherubim. 
The sacred place above the mercy seat was the precise location of God, and in this heavenly vision, the holy city built of redeemed men is the pr precise location of God. The tabernacle of God is with men. <clears throat> now this is uh, such a great work that this great voice had to expound it. Now the, the rest of our text in verse 3 is actually expounding this truth. <clears throat> that the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. Them who? <clears throat> John saw a city prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So who are they? Who are them? They, they are men. The tabernacle of God is with men. <clears throat> he will dwell with them. <clears throat> God will not dwell in a tabernacle that men must come to in order to meet him. God will not dwell in a temple situated on the peak of the city, but God will dwell with men. We can't consider these things without considering the gracious work of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the men that God will dwell with are the ones that have their names written in the Lamb's book of life. God will dwell with them that have overcome the world. God will dwell with the sheep that the great shepherd brought home. God will dwell with the church that Christ purchased with his own blood. This habitation was built by Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us in his blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We experience the indwelling of the Holy Spirit at the present time, as the apostles testified in Romans 8, 9, Ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. <clears throat> and Ephesians three sixteen That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And 1 Corinthians 3.16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? And 2 Corinthians 6.16, 6, What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell with them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This is the truth in the present time. This is very real. This isn't a figment of our imagination. We're not pretending here. God does dwell with us and in us at the present time, but it's by faith. That's, that is, this is the first fruits of the fullness that is yet to come. <clears throat> what John saw in Revelation chapter 21 is not God dwelling with men by faith. It is not God dwelling with men in some limited sense or only in a special location or only certain times. It is not God dwelling with men yet unseen by men. This is what we were bought for, what we were sanctified for, and what we were built for. This final habitation of God is what Christ Jesus gave himself for. This is the final and full dwelling place of God. Only when we experience God indwelling in this holy city will we comprehend the fullness of what the Lamb has done. God will dwell with them, and they shall be His people. Amen. And they shall be His people. One of the reasons this is stated in this language is so that God is shown to be faithful to His word, because, you know, this is a quote of what God has said in earlier scriptures. <clears throat> this is exactly what He said. He would do, in addition to the text we read earlier in Exodus and Leviticus, <clears throat> where God said He would dwell among the children of Israel and place His tabernacle among them. The prophet Jeremiah also stated the new covenant, which you're familiar with, <clears throat> where he said, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. <clears throat> what does it mean to be the people of God then? Well, for one thing, it means that we participate in the things that God has promised to His people. For example, there remaineth a rest, therefore, to the people of God. To be the people of God also means that we are the ones who serve God and who minister to Him and through whom God is praised. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, 
that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God cannot demonstrate certain things of himself through just any people. Only the church can be the people through which God can show his manifold wisdom. <clears throat> he can't do that through the heathen. God's people are not like pawns on a chessboard. We are workers together with God. We are in agreement with God. <clears throat> in the world to come, God's people are going to be the means of God's expressions of himself. Being God's people also means that those who were once not a people now have an identity with him which in time were past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Now presently, I am one of God's people. I am also a citizen of the United States. I am a citizen of the state of Missouri. I am also a member of the Blakely family, <clears throat> and probably we could make many other earthly connections. <clears throat> but in the holy city, his people will have no other identity than with God himself. Our citizenship will be only in the new Jerusalem. We, the collective people of God, will perfectly represent and display God's glory. We were made for him, and what glory it will be to be his people in the fullest without any hindrance, without any mixture. If Jesus has been faithful in preparing the temple of God, if atonement for sins and salvation is everything it is said to be in the scripture, if the people of God have been built into the holy city in complete righteousness, if they are indeed righteous, and if it is indeed righteous for them to be in that holy city, then it is righteous for God himself to be with them. Amen. And this is said, God himself shall be with him. This is a most wonderful thing. Again, the Holy Spirit's revealing to us the greatness of what is being seen in this holy city coming down from God out of heaven. In what manner will God dwell with men in the holy city? God himself shall be with them. Who will be his divine representative? God himself shall be with them. What part of God will dwell among them? Will it be his feet? as when he touched Mount Sinai? Will it be his right arm or his hand? Will his eyes be there running to and fro in the city? Or will we only hear the voice of God as they did in the Garden of Eden? Will it be only the Spirit of God that dwells among us? God himself shall be with them. He will not be there in a temple or in a tabernacle. He will not dwell with us through a king or a prophet or an angel among the people but God himself shall be with them. In his fullness, God will dwell with us. <clears throat> that is eternal life. This is what makes heaven heaven, because God himself is there. He will no longer be far off and separated from men because of sin and because of this defiled environment. In the holy city, there is nothing offensive to God. There is nothing in that city that is unlike him. There is no vessel there that is not ready yet, or that is not large enough, or not good enough. The work of Christ Jesus is so righteous and thorough that John later records in chapter 22 and verse 4, and we shall see his face. That is God's face. He will dwell among them. Now two times the apostle John wrote, no man hath seen God at any time. But in the holy city... God himself shall be with us, and we shall see his face. Job knew this. He said, though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. And Jesus promised it. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And here John reported it. God himself shall be with them, and they shall see his face. <clears throat> How often have the saints desired to see God's glory, willing to be content with some much lesser vision, knowing that just a little of God's glory would revive and strengthen us. As Moses asked for, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. 
And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by. I will put thee in the cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Oh, how things have changed in Jesus Christ. In the resurrection, we will all receive our houses from heaven, immortal, incorruptible, raised in glory and power. Jesus will fold up the old heavens and the earth like a garment and put them away. The new heaven and new earth will appear. All will be reconciled to God in the holy city. New Jerusalem will come down from God out of heaven, adorned as a bride for her husband. In the holy city, not only will we see God's face, but we will see him and live. Seeing God and knowing God is eternal life. The holy city is much greater than Moses saw there in the cliff of that rock. God himself shall be with them and be their God. This is the other side of God being with them and them being the people of God. <clears throat> he will be their God. If the people of the holy city are fit to be the people of God, then God can be their God. Being their God is contingent upon them truly being his people. God cannot be the God of a people who are not in agreement with himself and who are not like him. For God to be the God of a people requires that God establish his identity with that people. And for God to do that, the people have to be sufficient. So what John reports here is that they are. They are sufficient for this. The holy city is the people that God has been desiring and preparing through Jesus Christ all along. God has identified himself as the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of Israel, the God of David, the God of Jerusalem, the God of Daniel. God desires to be the God of his people. This too is part of the new covenant that he will be their God. Being their God means that God has chosen to devote himself to this people and no other. God was not the God of Israel and some other nations. <clears throat> his giving of himself to his people is exemplified in Abraham. <clears throat> when Abraham uh, sacrificed Isaac, the Lord said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Who else did God say that to? Just Abraham. He's the God of Abraham. You see what it means to be for God to be your God. None but Abraham. <clears throat> he was God's man, and God was his God. All the blessings on the race came through Abraham. That is what it means to have God as our God. When he blesses, he blesses his people. <clears throat> when God works, it will be through them. When God glorifies his name, it will be through them. When God gives, he will give it to them. They will inherit all things. Fear not, Abraham. I am thy shield. I am thy shield and exceeding great reward. Amen. God will be our God. <clears throat> Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. <clears throat> now if it seems to be a big thing for God to confine himself to just one people in the world to come, that's because we haven't yet comprehended the work of Jesus Christ. Amen. You haven't comprehended the holy city if you think this is too big. It will not be a condescension for God himself to dwell with us and to be our God in the holy city. It will not be a humbling experience for him to do this. There will not be any limitations imposed upon God by him dwelling with us and being our God in the holy city. And I want to close once again with this verse from the 102nd Psalm, 
When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. Amen.